would be a song. Yeah, like, it's no, used as sorry, a song. Wrong this is not the first. This is not the first of February. Okay, it's the sixteenth. Um, no homework. All right, we gotta. Right. We got. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, we have a uh, somewhat of a weird, uh, weird topic today. Okay, the title of today's sheer uh, is called. Raman versus Riaz and Thomas Jefferson on Kirke Avos. Is this on your YouTube channel? Uh, yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah, you didn't watch it, did you? No, I, I don't think so. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a sheer I gave in Yeshiva yesterday, and I originally wasn't going to give it here, and then I realized that it's very relevant to something that we did. Um, basically, what happened was I was looking through, uh, like, presidential stuff on Shabbos. For your podcast. Yes. <laughs> and... Uh, and I, uh, I found a letter from Thomas Jefferson to John Adams where he, they talk about Pierre Peavos. Okay. And I was like, oh, that'd be interesting wow. to bring up in class. Yeah. And then side point was someone asked me a question about the Rambam. And the answer to the question is also reflected in this letter to, uh, about Pierre Peavos. And it connects to the shirim I gave here about the um, archaeology and history stuff. So I figured it's kind of like a mix of topics. And it's just a one shot thing. Now, I actually, I'm um, only the first part of it is on a PowerPoint. The rest of it is in um, source packets. And I meant to print out more for you guys, uh, but I, I only have three. So if you want, you can have it. If not, I'll show it up here. So if anyone wants, then let me know and I'll give it to them. But um, okay. It's so it's all on there. Uh, it's all going to be on here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. And also, I didn't, uh, not all of the texts were available in English. And so, um, so I don't have. On the PowerPoint, we're going to switch to Hebrew in a second, but obviously I'll translate. Okay, so we're going to start off with a famous mock locus, which you might have done with Rabbi Freeman, I don't know, um, on uh, on the Rambam's view of what it, of what defines a heretic. Okay, and again, a heretic is someone who denies the fundamental of, uh, of Torah, right? So, um, so what do you call it? Um, also, just to be clear, you know, so if you're taking notes, I don't mind if you use that, but if you're not... No, I'm, I'm getting my notes up. Okay, all right. Okay, so he says, Hamisha Hainan Mikraim Minim. So there are five people called heretics. Okay, and in Ramam's, here he's giving a technical definition. He says, heretic is one thing, if you call it a min, apikoris is another thing, kofar is another thing. See, there's, these are like the five minim. Okay, uh, not, not, not the five minim like. Uh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, owner Shain Sham Eloa, the Vain Olamati. So, in, in uh, someone who says that there's no gods, so we call that an atheist, and one who says that the universe has no ruler. That's number one. Two, Homer Shiesha Manhig, someone who says there is a ruler, Avahim Shnaim O Yasser. But he's more than one, right? Okay. The Homer Shiesha Ribon Echad Elashu Guf Ubal Tumuna, someone who says that there is a god, but he is a physical, physical being, and what do we say, Bal Tumuna? Image? Yeah, he has an image, right? Or an appearance, or something like that, okay? For he didn't create others. Yeah, so this is definitely tied to the creation. It's unclear exactly what he means. Uh, I'm translating Rishon as primary existence and rock of everything. Sounds like an idea of creation, but I'm not sure. The Chena Ovid Elo Zulaso Kedelios Melitz Beno Levain Rigon Alamin, someone who makes another god into intermediary, like I worship God through something else. Okay. So each one of these five is called a heretic. Okay, so familiar ideas. Okay, but do you guys know who the Ravid is? Or Ravad? I've definitely heard of him. Yeah, so he is known for writing a commentary in the Mishnah Torah where he is very harsh in his arguments against the Rambam. So he, he argues, but he'll do it in like very harsh language. So for example, like there are really classic ones like, like you know, um, uh, what's like, like almost when he's like threatening the Rambam, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and his goal was to like break the Rambam's authority and make people realize there's more opinions than just the Rambam, you know. Um, right. Okay, so he argues on this third category, one who accepts that there is one master but maintains that, that he has a body or appearance. Amar Avram, he starts off his comments like that because that's his name, okay. <laughs> Lama Kar Lezem Min. Why is he called this a site? Uh, yeah, here min means heretic, right? So why does he call this guy a heretic? Okay, uh, read this as a diss. Kama gedolim v'tovim mimenu halhu b'zoh hamachshava. There's like how many great and good people like about us? There are yeah. so many. Mimenu from you. Greater than you. Greater than you, right? Uh, so there are a number of, of people greater and better than him, meaning better than the Rambam. Follow this thought. Okay, so there are people who are greater than the Ram who held that God was physical and had a body. 
or I had an image, okay? Now, why? Because of what they saw in the okay. in the text, right? In the Psukim. The Yoser mi Mashra Bedivri Agados. And more in what they saw in the Agada Yeah, the Midrash uh, Agada, yeah. right? Um Hamashabshos as Hadeos, which uh which Shibushes which confuse the minds. Okay. So what first of all, what is the Ravid's claim? Like what 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 claim he's making and what is his reasoning? He doesn't fully spell out his reason, but what is it seem like his reasoning is? That in like the Torah, they refer to God like his hands, maybe. Yeah. So like a physical thing. And like Midrash and stuff kind of like add to that. So that exactly. there is like proof to it. Kind of. Okay, good. That, that's exactly his argument. He's saying basically like, like if people read the Torah, they're going to see statements like God has a hand. And if they see um, Midrashim, then they'll find things like there's a Midrash about uh, God putting on tefillin, okay, mm -hmm. or God wrapping himself in a talus like a shliach tzibor. And he's saying that 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 people can easily come to the conclusion that God is physical. Now, is the Ravid saying that God is physical? No. No. How do you know that? He just doesn't say it. Well, no, no, he doesn't say it. He said that confused the minds. That confused the minds. So he's admitting that if you interpret the Midrash in that way, then it's a bad interpretation. But what? so what is he arguing with Ramam on? If they they're both agree that God is physical, that they're not a heretic. Okay, that, how can you call this guy a heretic? I'm curious why the Ramam didn't include it in one of his categories that you believe in God, but he doesn't have a Ah, he, so he uh, he does include. Ooh, hold on, good question. Yeah, yeah. So the the, the category is basically the Rama holds that these are mistakes about God Himself. Of course, is mistakes about God's knowledge to man. So, for example, if you deny Nebuah, uh, then you're an Apicorus. Kufr Torah is denying Torah beliefs. But I don't know. I, I don't recall offhand where. The Hushkaku comes in. So, yeah, but it's not in this category. Okay, good question, though. Okay, so, so we're, our goal here is not going to be to understand the Mach Locus, to, to define the Mach Locus, okay? Uh, the question that someone asked me was um, what basically, like, if there were people who were greater than the Ramam who thought this, then, like, doesn't that somehow, like, disprove the Ramam or doesn't that somehow, like, argue against the Ramam? In other words, they just want elaboration on that one point. So this person sent me a source, which I'm going to now switch from this to a PDF. Uh, you didn't guess that. Yeah, I did. Uh, PDF okay. is here. Oh, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> okay, so this is someone named, uh, who I had not, no, I don't know that much about, named the Riaz, uh, who is Rav Yeshayahu uh, Aharon Vitrani. He was an Italian region okay slightly after the Ramam all right so he starts off by saying uh he quotes the Ramam here on the on the left uh, left side Rabina Moshe Kasav and he quotes that whole thing we just read okay then he says like this Udvarav hain chutz mishitas hatalmud the Ramam's words are outside of the opinion of the Gemara outside of the opinion of the Gemara okay and the footnote guy I don't know who the footnote guy is quotes exactly what what um what I was saying of it says that God has a hand. This is the thing I quoted about how God, you know, puts on tefillin. So, so he's saying that there, there were, he claims that there were sages in the Talmud who held that God is physical. Okay. Now, whether or not that's true, let's just rely on his premise for, for, uh, just to understand his argument. Okay. But then he says, V'amnam, however, the mind does indicate the thing and the, the, the literal meaning of the Pesukim indicates that God is not physical. So the, the Riaz is saying, I agree, God is not physical. Okay. And he says, uh, uh, as it says in the Pasuk in Yeshayahu, El Mi Sidamun Kel Vukama Demus Tarahulo. This Pasuk that says, Who can you compare God to and what likeness can you make of him? Which implies that there is nothing like God and therefore he doesn't have an image. Because if he had an image, you could compare stuff to him. Right. So and Abim, all the images that the prophets saw, Inan Ella Bederak Nebuah. Those are only Kederach Nebuah. Those are only like prophecy. So they saw visions of God, but that's not doesn't mean God's physical. They were shown visions. Kamosh Nemar Obiad Hanavim Edrame Shakarish Baruch Hu Marelo Dimayon Nechbad Kadesh Yeda Hanavi Kize Zoh Nebuah Baalo Me Shakarish Baruch Hu. So basically, God was showing them a Nebuah to authenticate like the uh, revelation they were having. Okay, Ava Ikar Shakarish Baruch Hu Ein Lo Sof. Sorry, uh, this is supposed to say Ulay Sarkon Ruku. But God does not have a body. The essence is that God does not have a body. 
And anyone who's intelligent knows this, okay? Which seems to indicate, I mean, I don't know how you can say that the sages in the Talmud held that God, some of them held with God's physical, because now Did he's that? saying... I was going to say that. I mean, well, he, he said that earlier, right? He said that, that the Ram's words are outside of the opinion of the Talmud. Oh, right. But then now he's saying that all Chachmei Leib hold that God is not physical. So I'm not exactly sure how to reconcile that. Okay. Um, okay, so, so far he's agreeing, but now here's where he disagrees. Someone who makes a mistake in this, and doesn't go, you know, omek is, yeah, doesn't go to the depths of the matter. And he understands the psukim according to their, their literal meaning. The Savar Shakarsh Baruch Hu Bal and holds that God has an image. Lo Nikramin, can't be called a heretic. Sheim Kain Hu Hadavar, because if this were so, now this is his main argument. If, if someone who believed that God had a body based on the psukim and the Talmud uh, was a heretic, Eich lo pirsama Torah al davar zeh. Why doesn't the Torah publicize? Why doesn't the Torah publicize this? Below galu chachme ha Talmud lo hodia davar zeh begali. And why didn't the sages of the Talmud like make this open and talk about it openly? Right. Yeah. Okay. And then he gives an interesting proof. Ulahas yir nashim ame haaretz al kach. Okay. Fine. So that's. Uh, right, you, you know, back then, then women didn't learn, blah, blah, blah. So, and to why didn't the sages of the Talmud warn women and ignoramuses about this? Um, so that they wouldn't be heretics. Biyogdu olaman, and lose their olam haba. Okay? And then he, here's his, his proof, or one of his uh, proofs. Hello, kama isurin kalin kagon isur muktza bakiyotzebo, chibru chachamim, kama halachos, vihibru kama dikdukim, lahami koldar amakono. Basically, the Chazal talk a lot about lots of other lighter isurim, like they warn you not to move muktza on Shabbos, and all that stuff. So you would think that they would also warn you to not believe that God is physical and not believe that God has an image so that you wouldn't lose your Olam Haba. Okay, so that's like his main argument here. But al and so there's something like this where the entire belief system is, is, de is dependent upon. These will karis and you can get cut off from this world and the next world. How could the Chachamim not have like taught about this openly? Is this true though? Is what true? That they don't talk about it openly? Yes, so the sages of the Talmud do not talk about this uh, openly, and they don't warn uh, and, and talk about how God's not physical, and they don't talk about how like God doesn't have emotions and God doesn't change. The Rishonim talk about that, uh, but the Chachamim in the Talmud did not. Okay, Rambam so that, that is a fact. What was it? Not, not, not at all. Say again? Rambam. Yeah, Rambam. Not... So just to give you timelines here, so the Mishnah was written down in 200-ish. Right. Gemara was written in... 500, 500, okay. And then the Gaonim and Rishonim only started writing about these topics in like the 800s and 900s okay. and, and after, okay. So like none of the Gemaras and uh, and Mishnayos talk about God not being physical in like explicit terms like that, okay. So that's his argument basically, okay, is like if this is such a big deal, why did you got a timeline there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is that the Mr. Berkowitz timeline or is that? No. no Mr. Mr. Oh, nice, nice. Oh, I think I asked her for that once. I think I saw, I think she sent it to me. Yeah. yeah. So in other words, that's his major argument, okay, is that if this were such an important thing and if believing that God was physical could, could make you a heretic, why didn't the Chachamim warn about it in the same way that they warn you about eating Chachamim on Pesach and, 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 you know, doing Malafa on Shabbos? Okay. Mm -hmm. Hear the argument? Okay, and then he concludes, he says, So therefore, definitely, they didn't care about this. Meaning, they didn't care about warning people about God, believing that God's physical. Each person will believe in God's oneness based on his intellect. Okay. Uh, no offense. <laughs> right? Even the women on their, their lower intellectual level. Okay. Sha'amar Moshe Rabbein Alva Shalom Shmai Sarashim Okeim Hashem Akad. The only thing Moshe said about uh, about God's oneness is Shmai Sarashim Okeim Hashem Akad. Okay, there's only one pasuk in Torah uh, that explicitly talks about God's oneness. Oh, you know? it's Shema. It's Shema. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, so was, even the Torah doesn't go into detail, like talking about how uh, about the you know the detailed meaning of, God, of God's oneness. And his argument is like so, each person will believe it on their level. The Shema Ushma Lashon. Shmuav uh, lashon kabbalah. Shma means to hear and to accept. Al pi shmuav al pi kabbalah because you rely on what you hear and you rely on, on the tradition. Yamin dabrzeh. That's how you believe this. Lo nasan Moshe Torah lisra el b'derach amuna b'derach kabbalah. Moshe only gave the Torah to the Jews by matter of belief and and tradition. Chachmei ha Mishnah, Chachmei ha Talmud. Lo nis asku el b'derach kabbalah b'derach amuna. 
So now he makes another claim that the sages of the Talmud didn't only involve themselves in thinking about God's oneness by way of tradition and belief, not by way of philosophy. Okay. And they did not teach us to investigate and analyze God. Or on any other wisdoms. If there were like individuals who were expert in these concepts, they didn't tell the masses to do this. Because the Torah never commanded about these things. And then he just goes and blasts the Raman for being involved in Greek philosophy uh, for a couple pages here. Okay, so, so he really did not like the fact that the Raman was uh, involved in Greek philosophy. But what I want to focus on for here is his main argument, which is Raman claims every single person needs to reject the idea of God being physical. And if you believe that God is physical or has an image, then you are a heretic and you lose Olam Haba. The Riyaz is saying, if that were true, then the sages of the Talmud would have talked about it. And the fact that they didn't talk about it means that they don't care if, if people believe that, which means that they hold that those people aren't heretics. And it's enough to just rely on the simple law of Sukkim. Okay? Here's argument. So then we accept people who believe that? So we would, we would accept those people as legitimate full members of Klai Israel and not, not call them heretics. And, and, and by the way, just to be clear, what is he saying about the status of the belief itself not true. It's not a true belief, but he's saying that it's okay if they believe that. He's saying so of the five things that the Ram said are heretical, heretical, heretical yeah. Things, sorry. Um, the one that talks about you believing that God is physical, that's the only one he's discounting. So it is interesting. The Rivid, who we first read on the PowerPoint, only picks on that one. Okay. Okay. But the Riaz seemingly would extend this to all like philosophical concepts uh, about God. So let's say, for example, like, um, or at least like all the ones that are not evident from the the uh, the Pesukim clearly. Like, like I assume he would hold that if you think that God that there are two gods, then that would be a heretic. Or that there's no God at all. Or that there's no God at all, right? Okay. Let's say, for example, the idea of God being eternal, that's not openly stated in the Pesukim you know, uh, in the same way, like it says God created the world, but doesn't really talk about eternality. So my guess is if, if a person thought that like God came into existence at some point, then he would say it, it's that they're wrong, but that's not a heretic, okay. you know? So, that's our guess. Is he saying that like, at, you don't expect people to have the intellectual capabilities to go beyond what the Torah said? Yeah, and he's saying, I think he's saying a little bit more than that because he also says that even... Chazal didn't go into the philosophical investigation of these Ikarim. But I'm sure they did on their own. He's saying no. He's saying that, no. that they didn't in general. And if individuals went into it on their own, then they didn't instruct the masses to do it. Mm -hmm. And again, he, he is coming with a, uh, whether you call it a bias or a position, mm -hmm. uh, that he is anti philosophy. And again, like he really. He really go, lay, lays harsh into the wrong one for going into philosophy. So, so, and that, that's something like another topic that I want to get into. But, but I, I want to focus on just this argument about how if Chazal really cared about this and beliefs like this really made you a heretic, then they would have talked about it. I feel like, though, this is just a result. Like, I feel like there's a more of a Kabbalistic viewpoint, a view of like Torah. So, I feel like that just because of that, like, it's hard to like come to a compromise on his. Okay. So, it is certainly possible that his whole foundation is different. And, uh, and we, had, we actually did want to talk about that later on in the year. But for our purposes, I just want to focus on his one argument that, that uh, Chazal didn't talk about it and therefore it's not important. Okay. So, what, uh, the, who, so I, I, again, the Ramam, this, this guy came after the Ramam. And the, uh, so the Ramam's not there to defend himself. But who is the best defender of the Ramam? The Ramam. <laughs> okay. So I actually, when I thought of this, I thought of, of, uh, of a Rambam in his commentary on the Mishnah on. Um, <laughs> In Menachos, okay. So Menachos in general is about mincha offerings, but there is uh, a little bit about tefillin and uh, and tzitzis, okay. So the Rama mentions, and I accidentally cut off. Anyone else see the high pitch squealing? Yeah. It's going, yeah. It's going on the whole day. Yeah. Let me just see if it's. It's coming from. Oh, you want to hold on? Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, here, See, it sounds like it's coming from here. I, I don't know. I just thought it was that. What I'm wondering is. Maybe it's like an honestly don't understand. Yeah. Okay, I'm not the only one. That's why I asked also because I thought it was that. Okay. Anyway, after that brief little commercial break. 
So the Rambam in his commentary on the Mishnah talks about why why is there only okay in terms of like being part of of of, of uh, like a Jewish male's halakhic practice, tzitzis, tefillin, and mezuzah, well, mezuzah is also for women, are pretty important, right? Okay, but there's only one Mishnah that, that talks about it, it only says one line, okay? So the Ramam says, in the Mishnah, um, in the Mishnah yeah, the, the, there are more Gemaras that talk about it. So the Ramam says, and I cut off four words by mistake, he says, but the laws of, of tzitzis and tefillin, the mezuzos, the seder asiyasan, and how to make them, land and the brachos that are um, are supposed to be said on them, and all the laws related to them, and all the questions people ask about them, the goal of our work, meaning our commentary on the Mishnah, um, is not to talk about that. Because we are commentators. Now here's the part. The Mishnah did not include statements that were about all the laws of these 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 mitzvos, such that we would explain them. Okay, why? The Tam Hadavar Ladati, the the reason for the matter, according to my opinion, Pir Suman Bizman Chibra Mishnah. How would you translate that? Pir Suman Bizman Chibra Mishnah. They were public. They were well known at the time of the Mishnah. Okay. Um, the Shehim Hayudvarim Mifusamim Regilim. They were things that were well known and familiar. Etil okay. Hahamonim um, by the masses, meaning to the average people. Vayachidim Lo Nela Minyanam Meaf Echad. And the individuals, the the like the the Chachamim, knew all of them, meaning there was nothing hidden from them. Okay. Lefikach and therefore Lo Hayam Makom Ladato Ladavu Behem. Therefore, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi didn't see any need to talk about them in the Mishnah. Kishem Shlokava Seder Hatfila, just like they didn't he didn't write down the 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 Seder of the Tfila, Klamar Nuschasa, meaning like the text of the Seder. Um the Seder, uh, remember uh, who came up with the text of the Seder? Anshin Knesset Agdullah does it say when they were on that timeline? No. The men of the Great Assembly. Well, it would be by Ezra. Yes, good, which is uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, Avram Bibinet? No. No. No, I don't see that. Okay, so it was around like like uh the three hundred eighty somethings BCE. Okay. And the Siddur wasn't written in until like like fourteen hundred years later. Okay. So like they didn't write it down because everyone knew it. The Seder Minu Shleif Tibur, Mahmas, Pusumo Shadavar, and also how to appoint the Shleif Tibur, all because of the how public the things were. How well known they were. Lafish Lokibra Sidur Ella Fibur Sacred Vine. So what's the Ramam's answer to why I didn't write down the halakhos and mezuzah to fill in all that stuff? They're so well known. They're so well known that there's no need to write them down. And remember, why did Rabbi Huda Hanasi write down the mission in the first place? Because in danger of being forgotten. In danger of being forgotten, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So I think you could use that to address why the Chachamim of the Talmud didn't write down this stuff. Why? They didn't have to, they didn't have to right? Okay. It, is, it was well known. You know, so it's funny because it turns out that there are opposite assumptions here. The Riaz is saying that they didn't write it down, which shows that it that the masses didn't know it and it wasn't important. Ramban, I think, would argue that it wasn't written down because everyone knew it and there was no need to write it down. But there's something important to it still have written down. Uh, no. No, in fact, uh, because remember, it's us to write down to our whole family, only wrote down what needed to be written down to, to protect because it. Because it didn't need to be written down. And because this didn't need to be written down, then they didn't write it down then. Just like, let's say, between the Mishnah and the Gemara. Uh, here's another thing, okay? In the Mishnah, there's no men, no halachas of Hanukkah, okay? Gemara is where it goes into all the halachas of Hanukkah. Now, I'm going to make a, simple, a similar assumption. D does this mean that they didn't think Hanukkah was important in the time of the Mishnah? No. Is that they knew it well enough that they didn't need to write it down? You know, lots and lots of Gemaras like that, where, where between in three hundred years between the Mishnah and the Gemara, lots more stuff got written down because a lot more stuff was in danger of being forgotten. You know, you hear my argument? I kind of just have yeah. a problem with the people who wrote it down then because because <laughs> if you're writing, I'll let you it down, know nothing. You know, yeah. Yeah. If you're writing it down, right? Yeah. Because of, you know that you need it for the you is in danger of being forgotten. Yeah. Right? You can't just think about your generation. You have to think about generations afterwards. So I feel like ah, writing it down so just for your generation is... If if there was nothing wrong with writing it down, then you'd be right. You know, if there was if it was unlimited what you were and weren't allowed to write down. But 
it was still usher right down towards Rolpe, and therefore, you know, they had to invoke this principle of ace lasos lashem heferu Torah sacha, that we have to act for the sake of Hashem and violate his Torah by writing down towards Rolpe. In other words, it's usher to write down towards Rolpe, so they only did it minimally. Okay. You know, so that's why they can't just write it, everything that they could think of. Also, because writing it down can create more problems right. than keeping it uh, ball pack. Okay. Okay, now. Yeah. yeah. It seems like then this guy, it's the Riaz. Riaz has a different, uh, not opinion, but like a different idea of what Torah Shabbat Pet was written down for. It does seem like that, right? Which yeah. Is a big, and, and it, big thing. It, yeah. Now, there is such a thing as big mafloglum about how Torah Shabbat Pet was written down and why it was written down and stuff. Uh, I just don't know enough about the Riaz to know what his view is, but you, I, I would agree with your uh, inference is that it sounds like he has a different view. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now, Let's move on temporarily to this letter from Thomas Jefferson to yes. John Adams, okay? Yeah. So the topic they're discussing is the difference between morality in the Old Testament, meaning the Tanakh, and he's going to say, and, and, and Jews, and morality in the New Testament, okay? So he says like this. This is written in 18, uh, October 12, 1813, uh, okay? Dear Sarah. <laughs> so, so, so formal, okay? We're not going to read the whole thing. You don't know their name. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so we're going to read here. To compare the morals of the Old with those of the New Testament would require an attentive study of the former, a search through all its books for its precepts and through all its history for its practices and the principles they prove. As commentaries, too, on these, the philosophy of the Hebrews, that's us, must be inquired into their Mishnah, their Gemara, which I think is so funny to hear, like, Jefferson talking yeah. about Mishnah. Yeah, right? Yeah, right? Well, well, okay, well, not entirely. Kabbalah, okay. Jazeera. Oh. <laughs> okay, so I think this, I think it's safer Yitzira, which was a Kabbalistic text. So you probably got the, you know, the Y's and J's oh, are always like, so hard, you know, so hard, probably the Zohar. Zohar, probably the Zohar. Zohar. Yeah. <laughs> Kosri. Kuzari. Yeah, Whoa. so that was what we were talking I didn't figure it out. Someone in Yeshiva said it's Kuzri, probably, right? And their Talmud must be examined and understood in order to do them full justice. So this is a good example of intellectual uh, honesty. He's saying, I can't just like tell you what the Jews hold. You have to really do a thorough search of everything, okay? But then now he does something which is forgivable. He relies on an, ex, on an ex, uh, expert on the matter, okay? Brucker, which is uh, this, Brucker's history of philosophy, okay? This is, and Enfield is this guy, oh, sorry. <laughs> Brucker is this guy who wrote a history of philosophy. Enfield is a guy who abridged it, who wrote like a concise mm -hmm. form. So look, Jefferson is doing what we all do. When we don't know something, we look in an encyclopedia and like rely on summaries of what the experts find. So he's doing this, okay? But check out what the expert says. Brucker, it should seem, has gone deeply into these repositories of their ethics, meaning us, and Enfield, his epitomizer, his summarizer, concludes with these words. Ethics were so little studied among the Jews that in their whole compilation called the Talmud, there's only one treatise on moral subjects. Their books of morals chiefly consisted in a minute enumeration of duties. So what's he talking about? Pirkei Avos, right? And we mentioned this in the, how many um, Masechtos are there in Shas? 63. 63. And how many of them deal with ethics? Wow. Just Pirkeiavos. <laughs> and all 62 of them are laws. And if you just read Pirkeiavos as a layperson, it looks like just like little sayings, right? So in my opinion, he's making the same mistake that the Riaz is making, which is he's saying, you know, the Jewish sages only talked about it a little bit. Therefore, they must have not thought it was important. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, and, and he was working with the assumption that, look, I think it is a reasonable assumption if you were looking at, like, certain other types of things, you know, like, if you're looking at a, um, you know, a, well, actually, I don't even know if it's a reasonable assumption in other areas, but, like, in certain other areas, if something is important, you talk about it a lot, you know, um, so I, I see where he's coming from, but the mistake is he didn't know the genre he was talking about. Right. The genre is Torah Pet, which had certain principles about how it was written down and why it was written down. And the Ramam's principle about clearly, like, they talked about ethics a lot, but Pirkei Avos has a specific purpose, which is to pass down the, to show you the chain of the Masorah, to show that they were ethical people. And, like, you know, there's lots of other, uh, lots of other stuff also, you know? I, I'm curious why I didn't look in, like, Shul Muhammad's, like, Mishra. Or I was curious like about the exact same question. Yeah, like. You know, that's the Old Testament, you know? But then now he says something even funnier, which I don't know where he gets this from. Oh, for, he goes on. From the law of Moses were to do 613 precepts, which were divided into two classes, affirmative and negative, 240 in the former, 365 in the latter. Okay, so far so good. Wow, you live Yeah. It may serve to give the reader some idea of the low state of moral philosophy among the Jews in the Middle Age to add that of the 245 affirmative precepts, only three were considered as obligatory on women. So we were trying to figure out where we could get that from, you know? I don't really know. Like, oh, um, 
Nida, Hala, and Hala. 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 That, that was the theory that we came up with is that you're supposed to warn on Air Chavez, you know, the women of the household. So, but, but that, that's a pretty like a uh, big jump to say that they're only out here. And then he says, and that in order to obtain salvation, it was considered, oh, sorry, in order to obtain salvation, it was judged sufficient to fulfill any one single law in the hour of death. Um, the observance of the rest being ne deemed necessary only to increase the felicity of the future life. So that's based on a, a, a midrash that says that you can earn Olam Haba through doing one mitzvah per perfectly. But he's, again, not familiar with the Midrashim, so he took that literally and assumed that that's like a universal thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And he concludes with this, like, I I'm sad that Jefferson, like, if Jefferson thought this, what a wretched depravity of sentiment and manners must have prevailed before such corrupt maxims could have obtained credit. But then he says it is impossible to let from these writings a consistent series of moral doctrines. So, like, they dismiss Jews as not really having morals based on the Talmud. So, unfortunate, you know? Uh, so th this is that this, this is the other guy, yeah, Brocker. But, but uh, Jefferson is quoting it just relying on his uh, his expertise, but it is fine because Jefferson says, you know, you would need to do a full full uh, investigation in order to conclude stuff. You know, so he's he is intellectually honest. He's just like relying on the works of some other experts. Okay, now in the last twelve minutes, I want to show you another excerpt from um, from Joshua Berman, the person who we did with the archaeology stuff. Now, in my class on that, I talked about anachronistic fallacies where you take the way we think now and you project it backwards. Okay. So what he's going to talk about in this excerpt here is, you know, you would th where do you what do you think of when you think of Ju uh, fundamental beliefs in Judaism? Thirteen Ikarim, right? Okay. So he's going to show us that that's an anachronistic fallacy that we're committing. Okay. He says like this: um, the first rabbinic figure to lay down a list of Judaism's fundamental beliefs was, was Sadigon, 882 to 942, who lived some two centuries prior to the Rambam. His list is not widely known. I didn't know about it let alone study. It appears in a work he composed on the Song of David in his commentary on verses two and three of that chapter. Uh, these verses contain 10 terms of salvation and Rabbi Sadigon, hereafter Rasag, interprets each word to refer to a different fundamental tenet of Judaism. The specifics of the 10 tenets need not detain us. They contain elements that are familiar to us from the Rambam's list, the eternity of God, that God is the first cause of the world, that his, his rule of the world is just, and that the wicked are punished and the righteous merit all of us. So he wrote his own list of Ikarim. Okay, now here's the main point. But what is most remarkable about Rasag's list beyond any of the, of the particular tenets he mentions, is the very fact that he is the first major Jewish figure to ever compose such a list, okay? Nowhere in the Tanakh or in the Talmudic literature do we find a list of the basic tenets of our faith. This is astonishing because articles of faith would seem to be critically important. And it is even more astonishing given the minute detail with which uh, so many other aspects of the Masorah are presented, Think of the list of kosher animals in Leviticus 11 or the 39 Avos Malacha in Masaka Shabbos, in the Mishnah Shabbos. How could it be that something as central as fundamental beliefs had never been produced? That's his question, right? What's the most important part of your beliefs? Your fundamental ones. Why didn't anyone write a list before the ninth century? Okay. So there's no philosophy. Ah, okay. So here's what he says. You're, you're, you're correct. Uh, framing the question in this way suggests that there's something deficient about biblical and Talmudic thought for which we need to account. But this is hardly the case when we examine the issue in a wider perspective. Consider this. All of the cultures of the ancient Near East, from Egypt to Mesopotamia, were deeply religious ones, and peoples there no doubt believed many things about many gods. Archaeologists have unearthed religious texts of various sorts left by these cultures, omen texts, prayers, formulae for temple rituals, epics about the gods, and more. But none of these cultures ever produced a list of basic religious beliefs. So it's not just us. It's all belief systems. Okay, it didn't have a list of Ikarim. In fact, and this is truly revealing, None of these cultures even had a word for belief. Coming back to our own sources, we see the same thing. It is not merely the fact, astonishing in itself, that neither the Tanakh nor Chazal ever produce a list of basic beliefs. Neither in biblical nor in Talmudic Hebrew do we even find a word that parallels our modern word belief as a noun, as in one of the Torah's basic beliefs is. The nouns employed to convey this idea, emunot, deo, yisoda, and ikarim, are all post-Talmudic. So there's no even Tanakh word for belief or, or, or early Talmudic, you know, Talmudic sage word for belief, okay? If ancient religious cultures, whether sacred or pagan, indeed contain what we would call beliefs, because they certainly had beliefs, and we certainly have beliefs also, why did, they not, why did they produce no word for this seemingly critical concept? Why did they not compose concise lists enumerating these beliefs? Why was Rasag the first rabbinic figure to posit such a list? Okay, now he gives this beautiful muscle as an answer, okay? To understand why ancient cultures never formulated lists of beliefs, let us consider by way of analogy something closer to home, marriage, okay? 
Imagine that you are tasked. So relatable. <laughs> yeah. Imagine you are tasked with coming up with a list of the ten most important ingredients for a healthy marriage. If you are married, you certainly know that there are many lessons one must learn in order to achieve and sustain a happy marriage. In the course of your married life, you probably give thought to these on a regular basis. Yet, even if you have been happily married for decades, you would have difficulty penning such a list. And you certainly have not been rehearsing a little digest of such principles during your four years of marriage, right? If you approach any people who you know who have good relationships and you say, hey, can you just, you know, I forgot the list of the 10 things that makes it for a good marriage. Can you just tell me what they are? And they say, uh, uh, you wouldn't go like, oh my gosh, it must be that they have no idea what a good marriage is, you know? Successful marriage is indeed predicated on many noble ideas and attitudes, but these go unexpressed in systematic prose formulation. That's the key thing, right? a successful couple knows what a good marriage is, but they don't express it in systematic formulation, okay? For husband and wife, the ideals of love, loyalty, sharing, compromise, partnership, empathy, sacrifice, and more are communicated, nurtured uh, within a community, sorry. Do I stick to baby? Within a community. Saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> are communicated, nurtured, and clarified not through abstract and concise articulation, but through lived experience in complex and changing ways. Without even thinking which ideal is more important or how to define anything precisely, a couple learns intuitively what is required of them and to what they, and, and, and to what they aspire. An example, every couple knows the importance of communication, but it is useless to state communication is very important for a good marriage unless a much larger context is included. After all, if I'm feeling something strongly, does that mean I should immediately share it with my spouse? Should I tell her everything I'm feeling? Suddenly, a host of other considerations and ideals colors and shapes exactly what it means to engage in constructive communication. Communication between partners is not a value that stands in isolation. It is best understood and learned in, con in the complex web of a lived relationship. One more paragraph, then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the implications. It is the same with religious ideals and precepts. The Tanakh and the Talmud expect that Judaism's core ideals will be best communicated, nurtured, and clarified through a life lived fully within the context of a committed community. Our sources do indeed communicate ideas in writing, but always with only partial expression framed and developed for the needs of the given situation. And what was true of the Jews in the biblical and Talmudic periods was true for inhabitants of the ancient Near East generally, meaning the other religions. Their thought systems were also part of the warp and woof of the daily experience, lived and modeled by family members, neighbors, and fellow tribes in the country. So it was just, we, we like these other religions, have core, core beliefs, and we knew them, but it was not necessary and it was not expected to systematically write them out and define all of the details because that's not how beliefs work back then beliefs were lived so for example how how did we as jews for thousands of years relate to the concept of god's oneness primarily what was our main way of relating to it shema, shema saying the shema right and and talking about the Aserus Dibros, you know, and, and all that stuff, you know. Um, what was the way that we um, related to, uh, to Torah Mysenae? Not through going over a, a rigorously written out philosophical proof of Torah Mysenae, but through mentioning it constantly, for talking about God giving the Torah, for doing Shavuos, you know. Practicing Judaism. Practicing so Judaism, so. exactly, exactly, you know. So, so it wasn't until Sadigon and then the Rambam that, that they started writing down the Ikarim. And in, in his book, he goes into why they needed to do that. You know, yeah. part of it had to do with threats, let's say, from like the Karaites. So now you, we need to define, well, what does it mean to accept Torah and Shemayim? You know, or let's say like later on, he, he says that, you know, the Christians were claiming stuff about Mashiach and stuff. So we had to articulate, you know, uh, what we mean by Mashiach and and then later on, apparently from this trend of like writing down Ikarim went until like the 1500s. And then there was a long silence until when do you think people started in Judaism talking about written Ikarim again? Holocaust? Before that. Around there though, but like, before that. Like Poland, like. Yeah, what, what, what ch major changes in, in Jewish culture came up in let's say the 1800s? The drums. Uh, what came from internal, from Jew the Jewish people themselves? Christian? Was it no, close though, yeah. Reform Judaism and conservative Judaism and the Enlightenment. So that's when people started challenging these ideas again, and then that's when people started, like, going to the Ramam and the list of the Karim and stuff, you know? So again, I think that this is another example where if we look, there are people who will claim, by the way, and I, I think this is false, people will claim that because the sages of the Talmud didn't write down Ikarim, people will claim that there are no Ikarim in Judaism, 
Okay. There are people who call themselves, we call ourselves Orthodox. There are people who call themselves Orthoprax, which are Jews who keep Orthodox halakha, but believe that there's no such thing as, as a belief system in Judaism that is like passed down in the same way as halakha is, or they think that the beliefs are not important. And they're making the same anachronistic fallacy that the Riaz is making about beliefs in God of saying that since they didn't talk about it, it must not have been important. And Rabbi Berman is making the argument that no, no one talked about beliefs even in that time, even though it was important. And it was just not a genre. And they had beliefs that were simply passed on in another way, not through systematic expression. So I thought this was just a really good example of how easy it is to fall into mistaken thinking of like, well, if I were making a religion, I would write up important beliefs. And so they should have done it also. And like the fact that they, you know, it's just projecting your own ways of thinking backwards. And again, the, the notion that there's not even a word for belief, you know, is, is just a good example of how the, how deeply these anachronistic things can go. And like, you remind me when you're asking about hashgacha, I think I mentioned this before, the word hashgacha and the term hashgacha pratis was not invented until the 1100s, okay? Tor, the Torah will never talk about hashgacha. What, what will it say to refer to, to God interacting with us? Or what terms does it use? Miracle? Uh, it'll describe the particular miracles. It will talk about brachos and klelos. It will talk about God knowing Abraham. It will talk about God hiding his face. But the terms hashgacha pratis and hashgacha klelos are not, are not used until like the Ibn Tibbin family, uh, that's the Ramam's uh, translators, introduced it. Now, does that mean that before the Ramam time, no one believed in hashgacha? No, it just means it was talked about in different terms and expressed differently, you know? So yeah. All right, that's it. That's it for today. I hope, I hope this was uh, interesting and useful in some way. Uh, yeah. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. I was kind of looking at Jefferson and looking at the talk.